while I was away on my missionary trip, I received a text from a good friend of mine and the text message started saying, I wish I didn't have to give up things that I liked. And I was pondering about that because when we follow the Lord, it's hard when we have to give up the things we like. Do you find it hard giving up the things you don't like? Well, it is the purpose of this message that we can learn how it is that we can give up things that we like, or at least we once liked. It will make Christianity a great sorrow if everything you liked you had to give up. But we need to learn to hate the things we like. And then once we hate them, then we need to give them up. And that is a more natural, gentle, easier approach than just giving up things you like. That always seems like you always... Christianity is always spoiling the fun. There's always... That's the way it always comes across, that I, I like this and now I've got to give, the, give it up. It's a little, bit like, a little bit like the response of the rich young ruler. He had all these possessions and what? He had to give them up? And he, he was very sorrowful and he went away sorrowful. And a lot, of, a lot of us experience Christianity like this, that we come to the Lord and we, we actually come away after seeing God's will, we come away with sorrow. But Zacchaeus, on the other hand, didn't have any sorrow at all. He had joy when he, he was a rich man also and he had great possessions. And, and there's no record of the Lord telling him that he had to give his things to the poor. But he just did it. There was, a, there was something that was born in the heart of Zacchaeus that made the activity that the rich young ruler was meant to do, made it natural. And so there, there are two major driving emotions in our lives. Both are productive, both, both are zealous, and they are love and hate. Love and hate. Both of them have a power to get people doing things. Have you ever done, thing, done something because of hatred? You've hated something or someone that it's made you respond in a certain way. It's very powerful. And love is just as powerful. In fact, love and hate really lie very close together in many ways. But both of these, if we can understand the place that hatred has in, 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 the, in Christianity, then it would help us to understand how to give things up. If we can harness both, the, both these powers, we will have a very um, victorious Christian life. And so the sermon title today is called Perfect Hatred. I read a statement from five Bible commentaries, page 1142, 1, paragraph 8. It says, Amid impurity... Christ maintained his purity. Satan could not stain or corrupt it. His character revealed a perfect hatred for sin. Now, do you think that we need to take a lesson from Christ here? Christ couldn't, his stain wasn't, uh, his character was not stained. His character revealed a perfect hatred. Let's read Revelations, Revelation chapter 3 and verse 21. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 21. And this is the letter that Christ has dictated out to us today and in verse 21 of Revelation 3 verse 21 it says to him that overcome cometh will I grant to sit with me 
in my throne, even as I also overcame and am sat down with my Father in his throne. So what did Christ have that helped him keep his character pure? He had perfect hatred. And the scripture said that if we overcome as he has overcome, then we'll get this reward. So what do you and I need then? We need to have perfect hatred. Perfect hatred for sin. Do you have it? Do you have a perfect hatred for sin? Or do you like it? Read with me in 2 Corinthians. What do you do when someone points out a wrong? Say you've got a wrong in your life and someone comes up and points it out to you. Sometimes we hate them more than the problem itself for, for telling us. We get very annoyed or very upset when people come and point out our failures. And we can easily get a hatred for them. But what about our sin? What about the point in which we're wrong on? Read with me in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And here the Apostle Paul writes a letter to, to the church in Corinth. And he, ha he has to um, reveal to them sin different sins. And it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, and, and for the context of verse, verse 8, it says, For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent, though I did repent. So he... It's not nice. For, to, to be a gospel worker, you have to upset some people. You have to upset people at some point. And upsetting them in revealing what is wrong. Revealing what sin is. And here is his... It's, it's awkward work. You're sort of sorry. You don't really like doing it, but you're not really sorry. that you, You've got to do it. You've got to be, we've got to be faithful workers. So sin has to be called by its right name, but yet we don't enjoy just upsetting people for the sake of it it says i <clears throat> for i perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry though it were but for a season now i rejoice in verse 9 not that ye were made sorry but that ye sorrowed to repentance for ye were made sorry after a godly manner that ye might receive damage by us in nothing for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. For behold, this selfsame thing, that ye sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you. Yea, what clearing of yourselves, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge. In all, in all things ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. What did this produce? It, it, this repentance, but it worked something. A, a vehement desire. A revenge, a zeal. Was this not hatred for sin that this wrought in them? And so the, to, if, if we want to understand firstly how to get hatred for sin, the first step is admitting what sin is. Identifying a sin as a sin because the apostle was revealing a sin and he was, he was rebuking them in, their le in the letter. And as, as he was rebuking them, they received this sorrow. And this sorrow worked in them all these other things. So if there wasn't faithful, faithful revealing of sin, then there could never be a hatred of it. And so we can see that there are... <coughs> That there are two types, two types of responses to sin. Repentance. One is a godly one and one is worldly. 
Esau had the worldly one. In Hebrews chapter 12, we can read of that. If you turn your Bibles there to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews 12 and, and starting in verse 16. Hebrews chapter 12 and, and starting in verse 16. It says, Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For you know how that after, afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. He didn't have a true repentance. Do you hate sin? When we think, yeah, well, I hate sin. I hate it when, you know, my spouse commits adultery. And I hate it when someone gets killed. And I hate it when all these really obvious, um, terrible things are done. So, yeah, we hate sin. But there's a difference between hating the results of sin and hating the sin itself. Because the sin itself is a, is a mentality that produces these actions. Do we hate that? The lust of the flesh. So whether I lust after the, 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 the appetite or whether I lust after in, in the ways of adultery, the, the principles lie in the same area. There are three, the three great temptations that assail men. Three group, they're grouped into three great headings which Christ was tempted in in the wilderness which was appetite or the lust of the flesh and then presumption or the pride of life because presumption and pride are uh, linked in together when Christ was on the pinnacle and, and he says throw yourself off it was just to presume to make presumption so the pride of life and then when he was on the, on the mountain and he saw all these beautiful things, the, all the kingdoms and the glory of the world, it was the lust of the eyes. And that's what the scripture says. All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father but is of the world. Do we hate these things in their, in their seed form? That is the question. Because if we just hate the results, then we are really no different to Esau. In fact, it remi reminds me of the text where it says, As a dog returns to his vomit, so a fool returns to his, his folly. And so, you know, the dog just eats up its things and, and, and enjoys it. And, and after a while, the, you know, it was not right to eat so you know you've probably seen a dog when it's vomiting they look so uncomfortable they walk really funny and they sort of have you know head down and they're really not enjoying life at all they're really suffering under what they've eaten and until it's all gone and they're relieved of the pain once the pain's gone oh actually that wasn't so bad and jump back into it again and so we can we can think, oh, you know, uh, you might, we might have overeaten on some dish. And you think, oh, I never want to eat that again. Ugh, yuck. While you're full and you're thinking, oh, this is terrible. Uh, but then once you've recovered from it all, oh, it actually wasn't that bad. And you go into it again. And then you're in it again and you think, oh, I'm never going to do this again. I hate this. You know, I, I really hate this sin. But then once the pain's gone... Back into it again. Is that perfect hatred? That's imperfect hatred. Imperfect hatred for sin. And so can you see that we need perfect hatred for sin? Because it works. Repentance works in this the vehement desire, of revenge and all these things that we read in Corinthians. So, where can we get perfect hatred for sin? It's the first promise in the Bible. 
Turn with me to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. The first promise in the Bible is the answer to the question, where can we find perfect hatred for sin? Where can we get it from? Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. And the, and the Lord said unto the woman, sorry, verse 15, but speaking to the serpent, but I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Who will? God will do this. God will put enmity. Enmity is the same word as hatred. So here God is offering. I don't have perfect hatred for sin. We don't have it naturally unless God has, um, without this promise in Genesis 3.15, if this wasn't a reality to us, we could not be saved. But here God is saying, I will give hatred for sin. That is God's miracle that he wants to do, that he has done and wants to increase it in your own life. Because if we don't have that, if we don't have a, a hatred for it or any resistance at all for it, then the gospel couldn't reach us. And so there is to be a um, bruising of the head of Satan. Read with me in Romans chapter 9, uh, 16, sorry. Romans chapter 9 and verse 16. Sorry, Romans 16 and verse 20. Romans 16 and verse 20. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Isn't that a nice promise? Speaking to the Christian believers that the destruction of Satan wasn't just to be done on the cross of Calvary through the atonement of Jesus Christ, but to be reproduced again in the lives of his people. To crush Satan from dominion in their own lives. How can this be? But by perfect hatred for sin. And this is the gift of God. You can't earn it. You can't go and manufacture it in a workshop. You have to receive it from the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you asked lately for a perfect hatred for sin? Have you asked that the Lord would instill perfect enmity between righteousness and unrighteousness? I read a statement from Our High Calling, page 153. Paragraph 4, it says, But God is ever seeking to impress our hearts by His Holy Spirit. What? Sorry, that... I'll start that again. But God is ever seeking to impress our hearts by His Holy Spirit that we shall be convinced of sin. of righteousness and of judgment to come. We may place our will on the side of God's will and in his strength and grace resist the temptations of the enemy. As we yield to the influence of the Spirit of God, our conscience becomes tender and sensitive and, and sin that, that we have passed by with little thought becomes exceeding sinful. (coughs) 
This is the work of the Holy Spirit. Something that you thought, oh, it's not that bad. The Holy Spirit can make that exceedingly sinful. The thing that you perhaps once liked, God can make that exceedingly sinful to you. Increase a hatred for it. And so, the Apostle writes of this in Romans chapter 7. The experience in Romans chapter 7 is all about identifying what sin is. The first principle, if, if, if sin is not called by its right name, if things are allowed in the church that are wrong, that aren't identified as wrong, then it's a losing battle. Sin must be identified as sin. That's the first point. And that was the whole point of the law. To call sin by its right name. And so the Apostle write, writes in Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7 and starting in verse 13. Speaking of the Ten Commandments. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin that it might appear sin. Working death in me. By that which is good. That sin by the commandment, might become exceeding sinful. And then, with that realization, verse 14, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that... Do I not, but what I, I hate, that do I. <coughs> Sorry. So here, there's something to be understood when we start to hate sin. And that is that we're sold under sin. And so here we, we realize I hate something and now I'm doing something I hate. How is it that we can do something that we hate? If you hate it, don't you just don't do it? Is there some traits of character or some responses? You know, you may get cranky with the kids and you really snap at them and, and then you really hate yourself for doing that. Why do we do it? Because I am carnal, sold under sin. Notice what it says in verse 15, 16. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that is good. Verse 17. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. So now the Lord is instilling through his miraculous gift... Of hating sin. There comes a problem. And that is. Sin dwells in me. It's not about hating sin. As, as an external. Of. There's, there's something sinful. And I just want to run away from it. And, and live in a. Sort of a, a, a cotton ball. House. And never touch sin. I mean, yes, external or internal doesn't matter. You hate sin. But here we're seeing something. If we learn to hate sin, we come to an understanding that sin dwells in me. There, in my nature, there is these, in, in the flesh, as it says um, in verse 18, for I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing, for will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. So he's talking now of a du dual nature. The Lord has, has done something, a miraculous miracle in his life, that he hates sin. But now he finds that in my flesh, there is a tendency to sin. And there are habits that I have 
cultivated and there are, there are things that have been passed down from my parents and, and there's all sorts of things that I'm battling with. I hate them, but I'm doing them. Let us continue as we study. This will become very clear. In verse 22, it says, For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. I love God's law. I want to choose his ways. I want to follow his ways. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind. Two laws. The law of my mind and this other law of my members, the law of my body. And bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? So as the Apostle is, is relaying his experience, he doesn't want to disobey anymore. He wants to follow the Lord. But the, the, uh, how to actually engage in this battle with success, he hasn't worked that one out yet. At this point of writing. And these two laws... The law of God now, has he delights after the inward man. But there is a law, as it says, the law of sin, which is in his members. And now there's a conflict, internal conflict. One is a hatred of sin and the other one is a desire for sin. The actions of sin. And so this humbles him. This concept really humbles him. Oh, wretched man that I am. Who's going to save me from the body of death? What's the solution to this problem? The solution is found in verse 25. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind, I myself, myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh... The law of sin. And then verse, chapter 8 begins, which is really a continuation. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. There was something inside of Jesus Christ that gave him the victory in this whole episode. And we read in verse 3, For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. So here we see that as we get a hatred for sin and now we start seeing how strong our habits are and the inclinations that come from the, the carnal nature, there's a battle. And the only solution is in Jesus Christ. So... What did Jesus Christ do? He in, came in the likeness of sinful flesh and he for sin, condemned sin where? Okay, so Jesus had sinful flesh. And if you didn't, you couldn't condemn sin in it. So in the flesh, we're meeting the experience of the same flesh that you and I have. But as he did this, notice his victory. 
in Hebrews. It's written in Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 7 to 9. Who in the days of his flesh, Hebrews 5, 7 to 9, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared, though he were a son, Yet learned he obedience, how? By the things which he suffered and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. So here Christ had help in this, needed help in this, in this battle. And he cried unto him that was able to save him from death. He was, had to rely on the strength from the Father. And as he cried unto the Lord, he heard in that he, he, he feared, and he learnt by the things which he suffered. I want to read a statement from Review and Herald that sheds a lot of light on this. Review and Herald, December 20, 1892. How few have any conception of the anguish which rent the heart of the Son of God during his 30 years of life upon earth. The path from the manger to Calvary was, sh was sh uh, shadowed by sorrow and grief. He was the man of sorrows and endured such heartache as no human language can portray. He could have said in truth, Behold, and see if there be any sorrow like unto my sorrow. His suffering was the deepest anguish of the soul. And what man could have sympathy with the soul anguish of the Son of the infinite God? Hating sin with a perfect hatred, yet he gathered to his soul the sins of the whole world as he trod the path. To Calvary, suffering the penalty of the transgressor, guiltless, he bore the punishment of the guilty, innocent, he, yet offering himself to bear the penalty of the transgression of the law, law of God. The punishment of the sins of every soul was borne by the Son of the infinite God. The guilt of every sin pressed its weight upon the divine soul of the world's Redeemer. He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. In assuming the nature of man, he placed himself where he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, that by his stripes we might be healed. In his humanity, Christ was tried with as much greater temptation, with as much more persevering energy than man is tried by the evil one, as his nature was greater than man's. This is a deep myst mysterious truth that Christ is bound to uh, that Christ is bound to humanity by the most sensitive sympathies. The evil works, the evil thoughts, the sins of men. Sorry, sorry. The evil works, the evil thoughts, the evil words of every son and daughter of Adam press upon his divine soul. The sins of men called for retribution upon himself. For he had become man's substitute and took upon him the sins of the world. He bore the sins of every sinner, for all transgressions were imputed unto him, though he did no sin. Neither was guile found in his mouth. Through the, through the guilt of sin, sorry, though the guilt of sin was not his, 
His spirit was torn and bruised by the transgressions of men. What was happening inside of Christ? All our sins were laid in his body on the tree. And he hated sin with a perfect hatred. What torture. Trapped in one body. Couldn't run away from it. You couldn't do anything from it other than condemn it and kill it. That's all he could do. And so as this intensity of, of extremes, of, of the sins and temptations that you and I meet, how strong are they? Do you suffer under strong temptations? No one has ever had greater temptations than Christ. It says he, in his humanity, Christ was tried with as much greater temptation, as much as divine is above human. And so the power of temptation had to meet the power of perfect hatred. And they went head to head in the body of Jesus Christ. That is the battle between the spirit and the flesh that you and I meet. And that was Paul was saying, I've got this battle going on. I want to follow the Lord and I can't because of the temptations. How, who's going to help me? And then he sees Jesus. And in Jesus, he sees the answer. And that's not just the thing I hate that I do, but it's perfect hatred is what Christ had. Perfect hatred. And these are the sufferings of Christ. And, and so as this went on, if we dwell upon these scenes of Calvary, there's another statement from Review and Herald, January 16, 1894. Speaking of Calvary's experience, it says, it, Oh, if everyone could see the matter as it is presented before me in all its bearing, how soon would they quit with the enemy in his artful work? How they would despise his measure to bring sin upon the human family how they would hate sin with a perfect hatred as they consider the fact that it cost the life of, he of heaven's commander in order that they should not perish. That man should not be bound a hopeless captive to Satan's chariot, a degraded slave to his will, a trophy of his victory and his kingdom. Who will link up with Satan? Who will bear his badge. Who will choose him as a captain and refuse to stand under the blood-stained banner of the captain of our salvation? You know, if we, if we ever think, oh, I've got to give up something I like, do you know what you do? You take that thing you like and place it in the light of Calvary over the, the battle of ages and then think how you like it. Is it really worth it? A sin for a season at the expense of all of glory. And not just sin for a season, but every sin that we engage in is a sin Christ suffered for. So the question is, do I hate Christ and love the sin? That's what I've got to ask myself. It, if I have to give up something, what? I have to give up something I like. Well, you don't. You can give up Christ instead. Christ or Barabbas? Which do we want? Is our sin for a season worth more than Christ? Not at all. Not at all. Christ died for every son and daughter of Adam. And when the Son of God has experienced expressed such amazing love making his great sacrifice for the sinner in order that through faith in him he need not perish but have everlasting life how can the subjects of this great love be indifferent and stand in sin and disobedience and not heartily confess christ without a moment's delay 
How can anyone love to do evil? How can the youth... Um, yeah, how can anyone love to do evil? As it said there, if we would see it, if we would get a glimpse of Calvary as the Holy Spirit wants to reveal to everyone, we would hate sin with a perfect hatred. This is what he wants to uh, create in every single soul. Perfect hatred for sin. Because only there... Can victories be made? If we don't have the perfect hatred, then we will always be going on, I keep doing the thing I hate. I keep doing the thing I hate. Because we half hate it, we half like it. And sometimes, even in our mind, we try and serve two masters. We, we sort of like the sins. We like to cuddle them. We like, but oh, we don't like the results of them. I don't want the results, but I want the sin. Do you know what the Bible says about trying to serve two masters? In Luke 16 and verse 13, let us turn our Bibles there. Luke, the Gospel of Luke 16 and verse 13. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will hold to the one and despise the other you cannot serve god and mammon you will either hate one and love the other like it if we're trying to satisfy both lifestyles of trying to be a christian yet being in the world we will eventually come to either hating christ and loving the world, or come the other way, Lord willing, that we would hate the world and love Christ. That's what it says. You'll either hate one and love the other. You can't serve two masters. And so, as it says in Psalms 97 verse 10, if we want to love the Lord, there's only one option. It's an obvious one, but let's just read it from the Bible. Psalms 97 and verse 10. Ye that love the Lord hate evil. He preserveth the souls of his saints. He delivers them out of the hand of the wicked. To love the Lord is to hate evil. Now, when we understand the nature of Christ, that Christ battled in him the sin versus righteousness in Christ, and the perfect hatred for sin was, the, was a, a key ingredient for victory. This is a proper balance for hatred for sin. Because if we just go on a blanket statement, just hate sin, do you know what it's very easy to fall into? Hating sinners. You could easily hate a sinner if you hate sin. Oh, you know, I hate the world in worldliness and hate doing these things. And then if anyone's doing them, then you hate them too. And you just hate everyone and you just become a hateful person. The balance to hating sin and yet loving sinners is found in Jesus Christ. Do you know why? Because the hating sin is found inside of oneself. If Christ didn't partake of sinful, our sinful flesh and conquer it, and just hated everything, all sin external, he would have, um, it, it would have been a very rigid experience in this world. Because he was all okay within himself. No, no, no battles, no difficulties there. It's just everyone around him was all the problem. 
Whereas, because the battle was internal, then when you see someone else battling, you can actually have compassion on them. If you understand that within, the, within our system, the thing I hate, I do, then, then when someone does the wrong thing, you can hate the wrong thing for sure, but don't hate them because they're in a battle too. They're in a battle too. And so I read a statement from this day with God. Actually, I'll, we'll read Luke 18. While we're there in Luke, Luke 18. And here we see this parable of two men going up to the temple to pray. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. Verse 11, the Pharisee stood and prayed with him, thus with himself, God, I thank you that I'm not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as, as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up as much his eyes into heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful unto me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for every one that exalts himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Can you see the, the nature there? If Lord, I thank you that... I've got this perfect hatred for sin. I hate sin. And uh, these adulterers and these other people that are gluttons and everything else around me, thank you that I'm not like these other people. That is a, uh, a pharisaical outlook on hating sin. Did the publican hate adultery? Uh, sorry, did the Pharisee hate adultery? Yeah. Yeah, he, he was happy that he was an adulterer. Isn't that a good thing? The problem is this Pharisee didn't realize the battle in himself. He didn't understand pride. He didn't understand the carnal nature in, 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 its, in its degraded, in, in what we're born with. What our parents have passed down to and what, we, what come to us as temptations that cause us to, to sin. He was out of touch. And so, so many people today are out of touch with the battle between the spirit and the flesh and therefore have no compassion or very little compassion on others. This day with God, a beautiful statement. This day with God, 287. A great many are likely to be deceived in regard to their spiritual condition. In Christ, we shall have the victory. In him we have a perfect model. While he, while he hated sin with a perfect hatred, he could weep over the sinner. He possessed the, he possessed the divine nature while he had the humility of a little child. He had in, the, in his character that which we must have in our characters. undeviating perseverance in the path of duty from which no obstacles or dangers could divert him while his heart was so full of compassion that, that the woes of humanity touched his heart. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. While his heart was so full of compassion that the woes of humanity touched his heart with a tenderest, with tenderest compassion, he could not pass them by, for he was the great physician to heal the maladies of the human race. So as he mingled with people, he was very sensitive to the battles that people were going through, to their sicknesses, to their difficulties. And in that is what, as it says, we must have in our characters. 
When we come to the point, oh wretched man that I am, who's going to deliver me from the body of this death? And we find the answers through the gospel. Then when there is another wretched man who looks hopeless, couldn't he be saying in himself, oh wretched man that I am? And then if we see him saying, oh wretched man that he is, we say, yeah, I'm the same. We're brothers. Come, I'll show you Jesus. I found the answer. Here's Jesus. And that's compassion. That's understanding. Still hating sin, but loving sinners. And so for, it was for this reason that God chose Mortals to proclaim the gospel. Sinners to proclaim the gospel. Read with me in, in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 1 and 2. What does it say here? He wants there to be compassion and love on those that are erring, those that are struggling, those that are tempted and tried and fail. Understanding not to excuse sin, not to lower the gospel standard, but to come beside people. With understanding and saying there is Jesus, the atonement of Jesus Christ. Look at him and live. And so we see in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 1, For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for, for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sin, who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way. Why? For that he himself also is compassed with Infirmity. That's why. You can have compassion because we're also surrounded in a body that, has, that is not in its original form of creation. That is, the hormones are all skew if. You know, if, if you get the wrong chemical balance in your blood, how do you feel? Are you now lost forever because you've got the wrong chemicals in your blood? No, it's what you do with your mind. It's how you deal with it. It's how you apply the remedy in the, the mind cure to conquer the, the bodily problems, the upheavals, the chemical soup that goes wrong many times a day. And our faith to the Lord, faith is not feeling. Whether we have a good feeling or not has no has no weight at all with our standing of God. It's what we do with our hearts that matters with God. And as our faith pierces the feelings, then we can act upon faith and not upon feeling if we will understand the difference. And so that is one extreme that people go to of of hating sin you start hating sinners but christ never went there he hated sin with a perfect hatred yet loved the sinner with perfect love now the other problem is that you don't so much hate sin but you hate the people that reveal the sin Have you ever had something in your life or you, perhaps you have something in your life and someone has come and pressed the button, your emotional button on that point? How do you respond? Well, how we respond is, is greatly affected by whether we have a hatred for sin or not. You know, you, you might, a mother might be having trials and so an issue might be touched upon and, and there's, there's, a, there's a, a quick defense, a quick reaction of, Phew, leave me alone on that point. As if, the, uh, as if that point needs protection. And there may be thoughts, oh, you make me feel bad when you talk about that. I, you know, if, if, um, if I was to make a statement of what Christ did, you know, Christ was always patient. And you automatically think, well, I'm not. I'm not patient. Christ is, but I'm not. 
And then we start, yeah, well, Christ is and I'm not. And, and there's a, so an alienation there because I'm impatient and Christ isn't. And, and that's showing me up, being impatient. And so I just don't want to talk about it. Leave it alone. Let, let sleeping dogs lie. Let's not touch this sin. Yes, I don't like it, but let's not deal with it because it hurts too much. We can start protecting the sin. God needs to operate on certain sins and they need to come full out in one, at one time or another. Think of, think of, of, of Peter's sin. He was so full of his own capabilities. And, and so the time came where God had to deal with that full on. And did it hurt him? Yeah. Because when, if, if we want to allow the sin, hating sin to grow, we need to actually see it for what it really is. But you know, many of us aren't willing to see it for what it is. We want to actually live in denial. We want to live saying, well, my sins aren't that bad. And so we play down, we, we just put in the cupboard, we, we don't want to address the seriousness, exceeding sinfulness of a certain sin. Because if we were, it would shatter us. But that's the whole point. If we would actually see it, that the thing I have is so bad and allow it to become bad and see it as bad and, and um, magnify it as bad. And then you think, I have this huge sin. Then guess what? You need a huge saviour for that sin. And there is such a one. The, the more sinful sin is to you, the more precious Jesus will be to you. And so never, never be upset if your sin gets touched upon. Be upset with the sin. Don't be upset with the person who touched upon it, even if they weren't meant to do it. If it's a sin, it's wrong. Even if the person's out of place. And many times people touch on other people's sins and they, they are out of place. But as the person concerned, don't worry. Be upset with the sin, not with the person. Two brothers, Cain and Abel. Didn't Abel touch on some touchy points with Cain? And what did Cain do? He hated his brother. Did he hate the sin? No, it wasn't a sin. He hated the brother. He killed his brother. Perfect hatred for his brother, not for the sin. And then when the Lord came to spoke, speak with him, he did the same thing and he didn't even like the Lord either. Oh, you've punished me too great. You know, as if the sin was just a little thing and you've just made it bigger. It's all your fault. And, and it was a response against the person who was revealing what sin is. And so, the, uh, let us think, how do we respond when people reveal sin? I'd re like to read two texts to, con to conclude. One is in Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3, verse 1 to 4. Malachi. Sorry, did I say Malachi? My apologies, I meant Micah. Right. Micah 3. 1 to 4. If we don't hate sin, but if we don't hate sin properly, and we never actually get hatred, perfect hatred for sin, 
do you know what we will end up hating? We'll end up hating good. You can't serve two masters. You will either hate one and love the other or vice versa. That's the bottom line. This is what's going to transpire. So what sort of hatred are you getting? Are you getting really irritated with people revealing your sins or are you getting really irritated at the sins? Micah. <coughs> Micah chapter 3, and starting in verse 1, and he said, Here I pray you, O heads of Jacob, speaking of religious leading people, and ye princes of the house of Israel, is it not for you to know judgment, who hate the good and love the evil, who pluck off their skin from off them and their flesh from off their bones, who also eat the flesh of my people and flay their skin from off them, and they break their bones and chop them in pieces as, as for the pot and as for the flesh within the cauldron. Then shall they cry unto the Lord, but he will not hear them. He will even hide his face from them at the time as they have behaved themselves ill in their doings. Here is a people, and what have they done to God's people? L religious people? They've eaten their skin and they've, they've been cannibals, is what the scripture is saying. Now you know what cannibalism spiritually means? I read it from, from um, Adventist Home, page 440. Notice what this says. We think in horror of the cannibal who feasts on the still warm, trembling flesh of his victim. But are the results of even this practice more terrible than are the agony and ruin caused by misrepresenting motive, blackening reputation, dissecting character? That the children and the youth as well learn, that God, learn what God says about these things. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. The spirit of gossip and tail bearing is one of Satan's special agencies to sow, to sow discord and strife, to separate friends and to undermine the faith of many in the, in the truthfulness of our position. What is equated with cannibalism? Gossip, blackening character, misrepresent, misrepresenting motive, uh, dissecting character. So here is a, a religious leaders who, who actually like evil and hate good. What do they do to God's people who, who hate sin but love good? They'll start dissecting their characters. And as it says there, eating their skin and, and, and pulling them apart and gossiping, them, gossiping about them, misrepresenting motive, misquoting them, blackening their character, gossiping about them. All these things is what Micah was saying. And then when the, when the time of trouble comes, the Lord says, I won't hear you. I won't hear you. So the question is, how do we deal? How do we deal when people reveal what sin is? Do we say, oh, they're, they're fanatics and we start pulling them down and showing them how ridiculous they are? Or do we say, yes, yeah, sin is sin. Let's just swallow it. Let's just come to terms with the fact that I'm riddled with a sinful flesh that needs to be, sin needs to be condemned in it, just like it was in Jesus, for me to be able to overcome as he overcame. So the last text that I want to conclude with is in Amos. These people in Micah, they hate the good and love the evil. And in Amos, which is two books before, Amos, uh, sorry, three books before. <coughs> um, Amos chapter 5 and verse 14. Seek good and not evil that ye may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, shall be with you as ye have spoken. Hate the evil and love the good and establish judgment in the gate. It may be that the Lord of hosts will be gracious unto the remnant of Joseph.
And then he says, Therefore the Lord, the God of hosts, the Lord, uh, the Lord saith thus, Wailing shall be in all the streets, and they shall say in all the highways, Alas, alas. And they shall call the husbandmen to mourning, and, and such as are skillful to lamentation of wa to wailing, and in all vineyards shall be wailing, for I will pass through thee, saith the Lord. Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. As if a man f did flee from a lion and a bear met him, or went into the house and leaned his hand on the wall and a serpent bit him. Shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light, even very darkness and no brightness in it? This is how the Lord's coming. Do we want to have a mercy in this time? Then he says in verse 15, Hate the evil and love the good. That it may be that the Lord of hosts will be gracious unto the remnant of Jacob. This is a life and death matter that we learn to hate sin. Love sinners. Hate sin. Never lower the standard of righteousness. Never palliate wrong within yourself if it's wrong come to the lord and plead before him cry unto him and say lord i hate this thing or even if we don't hate it yet ask him to ask him please give me hatred as it says in in uh, fourth manuscript releases ellen white writes will you not strive more earnestly for the crown of immortal life will you not hate sin and pray most earnestly that you may have the sense of its exceeding sinfulness. That was from four, 14 manuscript releases, seven, 73, paragraph 2. To pray, Lord, give me this hatred. We can't, we can't manufacture it. It's a gift from God. And if we would submit, if, if we would say, okay, Lord, this thing that I actually like is, is sin, well then... Make me hate it. Cause me to hate it. And never call it anything else but sin. Don't justify it. Just that's what it is. And the Lord may have mercy on, the, on, on such that have learnt to hate sin with a perfect hatred as Christ had, which gave him the victory. I pray that we can overcome as he overcame. Amen.